Hi everyone, I hope you're all well and have been enjoying the great weather that we've been having in the UK so far for the past few days. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Zakir Ilyas and I'm a member of the marketing team here at the Equal Group um, and I will be your host for today's webinar. So today's webinar is all about navigating gender and identity in the workplace and we'll be discussing points such as managing gender related issues in the workplace, practical tips to creating LGBTQ inclusive workplaces and the evolving terminology of gender and identity. So today I am joined by a very exciting panel of guests. You'll be hearing from Jessica Lynn, a world renowned transgender advocate, educator, activist and global ambassador, as well as Alan Reed, who is an equality, diversity and inclusion consultant here at the Equal Group. So I'm just going to pass on over to our guests now so that they can give us a brief introduction of themselves and what they do. So over to you, Jess. Hi, you guys. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Lynn. I'm, um, I live in England, but I am originally from California. I'm a global ambassador to the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. And I technically, I travel the world speaking about transgender issues. I'm currently in the Netherlands. So thank you for joining us. And I'm Alan Reed. I, as Sikhia mentioned, I'm an EDI consultant at the Equal Group, and I am a non binary uh, person and uh, LGBTQ plus activist. Thank you for those introductions. Um, and I'm sure the audiences are looking forward to what you both have to say today. I think it's very clear that both panelists have a huge wealth of experience and knowledge. So I think this will be a very informative and insightful discussion. So um, for those of you who are watching, if you do have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to post them in the Zoom chat. Um, I really want to highlight that this is a safe space, so no question is a silly question. Um, and then we will have time to answer these towards the end of the session. Also, feel free to comment if you do feel like something resonates with you too. We would really like this to be a very interactive session. So we really encourage you to all share your pictures or any thoughts that you have of the webinar on social media with the hashtag TEG webinar. And also don't forget to tag us on at the Equal Group on Instagram, Twitter and LinkedIn too. I think that is it for introductions then. I guess we can move straight on to our first presentation. So I'm going to hand on over now to Jessica. Hi, you guys. I imagine that many of you have flown. You know what it's like. You're anxious to get this through security only to wait at the gate, relieved to finally board only to be bored again, this time with less leg room. Eventually your flame comes out of the clouds and you're looking at a new city or maybe it's home, but you've seen it from the sky for the very first time. You're looking down at a sea of stories, which you are only a drop. It humbles you. And while he may have never flown, I don't think anyone could describe this effect more beautifully than Charles Dickens. A wonderful fact to reflect upon that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. I want you to think about these words. It was written 130, 140 years ago. A solemn consideration. When I enter a great city by night, that every one of those darkly clustered houses encloses its own secret. Think about those words that he is saying, that every beating heart in the hundreds of thousands of breasts there is, in some of its imagining, a secret to the heart nearest it. Charles Dickens wrote that about 130, 140 years ago, A Tale of Two Cities. And I want you to imagine yourself and you're in an airplane and you're flying across any country across the world. You're flying in this big, beautiful blue, blue planet that we all live on. And you're looking down at that airplane window and you're looking down at the millions and millions of cities, the towns, the, all the different countries across this big, giant, beautiful planet. And you're looking at the millions and millions and millions of homes the automobiles and the billions of people down there. Do you ever look out that window, that window and do you ever, ever wonder? Do these thoughts ever come through your mind? Who are they? Who are those billions and billions of people on that giant, beautiful blue planet that we live on? What are their secrets? Just like Charles Dickens just said, everybody in that city at night has a different secret. What are their stories? Think about it. Think about that. What are their truths? What are their 
journeys. On that big, giant, beautiful planet that we just flew over, there are 7 billion, 800 million of us. Think about that number for one second, how large it is. For me to count to 7 billion, 800 million, I would have to start counting one, two, three, four, and it would take me 250 years of nonstop counting to get to that 7 billion, 800 million figure. And that is how many different stories, different paths, different truths, different journeys there are. And yet no two of us are the same. It's not just our genetic makeup, our environment, events in our lives. These things do so much more to shape us. They write our stories. You could clone my DNA or find my lost, long lost twin, but there will never be another me and there will never be another you. Think about this. In that giant, beautiful blue planet that we just flew across, there's 195 different countries. 4,300 different religions, six and a half thousand different languages. This is what makes this world a beautiful and diverse planet. Everybody's different. Everybody has a different story. Everybody has a different journey. Think about this. One of the most beautiful statements ever written. The beauty of the world lies in the diversity of its people. Different music, different gods, different cultures, different language, different foods. This is what makes us a beautiful, beautiful planet. But a word that goes along with diversity, which means completely the opposite, is discrimination. And what is it to be discriminatory? And what is it to be prejudiced? Very, very few people would readily admit it, but it's innate in each and every single one of us. Every single day, we make assumptions about people that we do not know. We hope to be understood as unique, the protagonist in our own story. But when we form an opinion about someone based only off of a trait that they share with somebody else, we are not treating them as an individual with their own story. However common these beliefs may be, they cease to be benign when they influence our decisions. This is what leads to discrimination. Who is it that decides how you're going to dress, who you're going to love, who you're going to marry? Who is it that says what is right, who and what is wrong? Who decides, quote, what is normal? Think about this for generations after generations. These are the questions. We don't have supreme leaders. We don't have one God. We have multiple gods, multiple languages, multiple diverse countries. And this is what makes us unique. It's a beautiful, beautiful planet. And you think about the discrimination for generations after generations for people because of the color of their skin. It happened across America where I'm originally from. It happened across England, across all parts of the world. They used to have colored drinking fountains in America. People were not allowed to ride on the front of buses. They was just treated like absolute living hell. This has gone on since the beginning of time. And in the year 2021, it is still happening today because of the color of some people's skin. Think about this. Think about the discrimination against people with a certain skin color. Now, I bet you don't really think about this too much, but did you know about how much discrimination there was because of people born with red hair? To me, red hair is absolutely beautiful. My youngest son has red hair, Ginger. To me, it's absolutely gorgeous. But what did they do for generations after generations, people that were born with red hair? They were either burned alive or they were drowned. They were burned alive at the stake. They were considered witches or warlocks because of the color hair they're born with. They're born with red hair. They were discriminated against because of the color of their hair. Now, how many of you out there are left-handed? It says we have 175 people watching right now. That So that means that there's 17, 18. It's roughly 10% of the world's population is left-handed. But did you know about the discrimination against left-handedness? This is something for those people that are out there left-handed, when did you choose to be left-handed? Or those that are right-handed, me, I'm right-handed. 
When did I choose to be right-handed? I didn't. I just was either or. This is my mom. She was born in Manchester, England in 1934. And when she was a young girl going to school, she started writing with her left hand and drawing with her left hand. When she was in school, the teacher would tie her left hand behind her back and force her to write with her right hand. They would hit her with a ruler saying it is, quote, not normal to write and draw with your left hand. We need to fix you. So as I said, for generations, people have been discriminated against, very similar to being red haired, to consider witches because they wrote and drew with their left hand. And then, like I said, in some schools and churches across the world, people would be punished for writing with their left hand. Think about this. This is a book out of the United States of America, 1930s to 1940s. The prevention and correction of left-handedness in children. And in some countries, it was illegal to be left-handed. Think about this. Because you write with your left hand, it is illegal. Think about that. So another term that you may have heard, and some people, you know, it's, it's more common than we really know, but it's intersex. Roughly 1% to 2% of the world's population are born intersex. It used to be called hermaphrodite. The technical term of it is disorders of sex development. This is one of my closest friends in the world. She was born in 1949 in Oklahoma. And when she came out of her mother's womb, she had both a penis and a vagina. The doctor looked at her and was stunned. And she said, you know what? Her penis is larger than her vagina. We are going to announce that she is a male. They wrote male on her birth certificate. To fix her, they did four surgeries on her by the time she was five years old. They pumped her full of testosterone to live the life of a boy. She didn't want to live the life of a boy. She wanted to be a girl. So what did they do to fix her? In the University of Oklahoma, they strapped her to a table when she was nine years old and did electric shock therapy on her to fix her because she was not normal because of the genitalia she was born with. Think about this. Like I said, these are the things that people have been discriminated against for generations after generations. It is still happening now and it will continue. There's no political, there's no religion. This is all people that are born, mental ability, ethnic origin, health. These are the way people are born and there's discrimination against because of the way they're born. And today we're going to focus on the LGBT community. We're going to focus specifically, I am going to specifically focus on the letter T, the transgender community. Because to be honest with you, education is the very, very best way to help end discrimination. It is one of the greatest ways in the world that we can battle discrimination to help people understand a little bit more about what it means to be transgender. So I have a question for you and I can't see you guys answering or anything like that, but how many of you know a transgender person? I was recently in Israel. I had 350 students in front of me. I asked that question. Three hands went up. Two of them happen to be professors. Not a lot of people know somebody that is transgender. But in a recent poll in the United Kingdom, 90% of people in the United Kingdom say that they know somebody that's lesbian, gay, or bisexual. But these same polls show that only 20% of the same polls know somebody that is transgender. One of the reasons why it is so small is the transgender community isn't a large community. We only make up about 0.6% of the world's population. We do believe it's somewhere between two to four percent, but because of the discrimination, people don't feel comfortable coming out. How do you tell your mom and dad, your brothers, your sisters, that you're not comfortable in the gender you're born with? There's a hell of a lot of discrimination. And in the United Kingdom, there's roughly 600,000 people identify un under that transgender umbrella. But even though I personally find England, the most open and acceptably accepting country on planet Earth, there are still situations that are pretty hard on the transgender community. One in eight transgender people have been physically attacked by colleagues or customers at work. Think about that. That's over 10%. One in eight in trans people have been physically attacked in England because they're transgender. Two in five transgender people have had a hate crime committed against them the last year, and two in five young
young transgender people have attempted to take their own lives. This comes out of Stonewall's latest report. This is because of discrimination. And one of the most easiest ways to help fix is to help people stop misgendering and dead naming. This is what I'm going to spend a little bit of time. I only have about less than a half an hour to talk to you guys today because we have a lot to put into this podcast or this, this presentation. And so I am going to spend as much time as I can and for what I find some of the most important areas of being an ally to the transgender community. And what do misgendering and dead naming mean? Right? Misgendering is when somebody refers to somebody, a trans person, using me, you would call me, if you guys can see me, I am a female, but calling me a male, calling me he, him, his. This is what misgendering is, you know, using my birth um, sex as, you know, what you would call. I am a, I transitioned over 10 years ago. I am who I am. And that is what it is. That's what misgendering is. Um, or, and dead name means using me, calling me from my birth name. I have friends in California that still dead name me, calling me Jeff, calling me he, him. They fully accepted me of my transition, but they still then dead name me. And that is something that is still happens in the year 2021. And when done deliberately, they're both deeply and hurtful. They feel like a knife going in your belly. I've been misgendered and, and dead named so many times in the past. It hurts. And if you hear people do this, stand up as an ally and challenge the person staying it. It is up to each and every single one of us to help put an end to this. People may incorrectly judge someone by the, by based on primary or secondary character, sex characteristics. It may be an absence or presence of facial hair, breast tissue. You know, a trans man may still have his breast, wearing binders, or could be vocal, vocal pitch. It's very, very common of trans women to get discriminated, especially when it comes to phone calls. I have a workshop specifically designed on how to answer phone calls to the transgender community. Gender markers also, official paperwork is NHS card, passport, driver's license, all will have either an M for male or F for female. Some countries now are allowing X for non-binary people, which I think is phenomenal. These gender markers don't always align with somebody's gender identity. All right. And in some cases, people can do it just to be an asshole, just to be mean. It is very, very common. And sometimes this can be extremely, extremely painful and harmful to the transgender and non-binary community. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Laverne Cox. She's one of the most beautiful trans women I know. Personally, I want to punch her in the throat because she's so beautiful, right? I met her in San Francisco a few years ago. And but when she transitioned in New York in the United States, she used to carry her phone number and address and, and, and her name because she was being misgendered so commonly that she was about to take her own life. It was so painful for her that she used to carry her name around. It is one of the most common areas of suicide in the transgender community by being misgendered and dead naming. This happens a lot. A young trans boy in San Diego, California, took his own life because he went into hospital for suicidal thoughts and the hospital kept misgendering him. Think about this. He went in there for suicidal thoughts and the hospital kept misgendering him. He left hospital and took his own life. And how do you gender somebody correctly? Ask. If you're meeting somebody for the first time and aren't aware of their pronouns, what are your pronouns? Do it nicely. across. Don't do it across a room. Don't say across a classroom. Are you a boy or a girl? Come up to them quietly and very, what are your pronouns? Never assume somebody's pronouns based on their identity or their appearance, right? Everybody has a different appearance. Incorporate your pronouns into your introductions. Hi, I'm Jessica. I use she, her pronouns. What are your pronouns? Not preferred pronouns pronouns. Preferred makes it sound like it's um, suggesting that it's not mandatory. Um, but the thing is, is uh, 
do it nicely and it goes huge way put it on your name tag put it on your desk thing put it on the bottom of your email these are great ways to do it and always use the correct name and pronoun for the person even when they're not in your presence when you leave this presentation today you don't say that guy jeff jeff or that guy you know you talk about me as she her i am she her it continues continues every time if you're unsure of somebody's gender um and you're speaking that about them in the third person um use gender neutral language i suggest you use gender neutral language in everything you do if you answer the phone when you're greeting somebody don't say hello sir hello ma'am say hello jessica how are you why do we need to use sir and ma'am in everything we do it's one of the greatest ways to stop it okay and what to do if you misgender somebody accidents happen i misgenders people i still make mistakes maybe you didn't know maybe you forgot right simply correct yourself move on and try not to do it again i'm sorry i didn't know and don't let it happen again write it down on a piece of paper fix it make sure that you do not let it happen again if you hear somebody misgender a friend correct them it is sometimes like i said misgendering is the most painful thing in the world and this is the most extremely important thing in here avoid apologizing profusely or undrawing unnecessary attention to the situation this may make the misgendered person more uncomfortable if i'm going to make a big deal out of it it makes that person more uncomfortable so as i said today we're speaking about what it means to be transgender i am and i didn't one of the things is is people say oh you just woke up at 45 years old and decided to transition no this was a lifetime of pain this was a lifetime of absolute agony of absolute living in hell and one of the greatest ways we have found to help people understand what it means to be transgender is by telling our personal journeys because it is hard to hate somebody whose story you know so today i'm going to spend about another seven or eight minutes telling you a little bit about me and what i've gone through to be me you see i was born jeffrey allen butterworth january 29th 1965 i'm old you can see i'm 56 years old and i was born a cute little baby boy you can see these old black and white pictures i had two older brothers and a younger brother and an older sister but as far back as i can remember three maybe four years old i wanted to look act dress and live as a girl and it did not make sense you know the term transgender was never coined until 1965 the year i was born so nobody knew anything about it we didn't have social media we didn't have television that talked about this but at this age i wanted to look act dress and live as a girl and it did not make sense it wasn't something you could talk about so my mom was a christian woman she said jeff if you pray hard enough god will move mountains so every single night i was at my hands and knees begging god night after night day after day saying god please turn me into girl and i wake up and i'm still a boy and i would cry myself to sleep for years after years after years it was torture crying begging god night after night day after day i would go to school with my very best friend michelle here i am at five years old in 1970 go to school with my very best friend michelle after school we go to her house and we play dolls and we play tea party we play dress up at this age i wanted to be my very best friend friend Michelle and it did not make sense who the hell wants to be a member of the opposite gender but the feelings went away they just grew stronger and stronger and stronger and a lot of people say well no child knows by this age but numerous studies have proven that by the age of four most children have a stable sense of their gender identity this study comes to american academy of pediatrics i'm an advisor at the university of oxford and we have a study coming out in february that proves even more and numerous numerous studies have the same thing so here i am four five six seven years old begging god night after night day after day to turn me into girl and it's not happening Happening. so I'm now I'm saying God if you cannot turn me into a girl take these goddamn feelings of wanting to be a girl away from me it doesn't make sense to a child at five six seven years old that I want to be a member of the opposite sex but the feelings didn't go away they just grew stronger and stronger and stronger and life went on became harder and harder and harder when I was about seven years old as in this picture right here and I learned the difference between boys and girls 
boys have a penis and girls have it. If I got rid of that penis, I'd be a girl. So at seven years old, I snuck a razor blade into bed and physically tried to remove my penis. Think about that, guys. At seven years old, I tried to cut off my penis. I didn't get too far, as far as you can imagine. So now I started doing different activities and I do anything, collecting bugs. I lived on a farm, collecting my chickens, raising chickens, raising rabbits, doing anything I could, focusing all of my time and attention into different activities to stop me thinking about wanting to be a girl. They're called coping mechanisms. And a lot of the older LGBT world did exactly this, including me. Then I found that when I have a pencil and paintbrush in my hand at seven, eight, nine years old, I'm not thinking about wanting to be a girl. So I started obsessing with painting. And I was painting seven days a week, 24 hours a day. When I'm painting that eagle for three, four hours at nine, 10 years old, I'm not thinking about wanting to be a girl. And I became a damn good artist. As I said, I painted this when I was 11 years old in one six hour sitting. For that several hours, I was not thinking about wanting to be a girl. But my parents are British immigrants. They introduced at a young age, me and my brothers to the game of football in America. It's all soccer. And they joined me up in soccer. They would drag me to the field Tuesdays and Thursdays. And I didn't want to play. But then when I found that I was on that field for 90 minutes trying to get that ball on that net, that stopped my suicidal thoughts. That stopped me thinking about hurting myself. This became the next greatest coping mechanism. And I obsessed with it. And two thirds of transgender teens have depression. And many also have suicidal thoughts and self-injuring behavior. It's very, very common. And most transgender teens, drug and alcohol abuse goes up between 30 to 40% compared to 9% of the general population. But this is what I did. I obsessed with football and became better and better and better. I'm um, playing on numerous teams. I became so good when I was 15 years old. I was asked to try out for the 1984 Olympic team for the United States, and I was offered multiple scholarships. But when boys and girls are 15, 16, 17 years old, boys and girls start dating, specific, especially in California. I wasn't particularly interested in girls. I had crushes on all of my teammates. But when I was 17 years old, I met a young girl. I started a friendship with her. Her and I became really close friends. I felt comfortable with her and I started a boyfriend girlfriend relationship with her. We were together for six, seven months and I came out to her what, what I wanted to do. I didn't understand my self sexuality then, but she fully accepted me. This is 1982 when she was 15 years old. I loved her. She accepted me and I just felt really, really comfortable with her. We were together for about four years. On Christmas 1984, I bought her a beautiful diamond ring and on Christmas 1984, I proposed to her. Maybe one day these feelings will go away. She loved me and accepted me and everything has gone fantastic. So now the year is 1985, the world at my fingertips. I have somebody that loves me and accepts me and everything's fantastic. On the way home from work, three weeks before Christmas of 1985, I picked her up from work and we're heading home when we come through an intersection. As we come through this intersection, a lady that was high on heroin and drunk ran the red light at 65 miles an hour broadsiding us. We rolled a total of seven times. You can imagine her, how horrific that car accident was. That's a picture of me on the stretcher being put into the helicopter. During that helicopter flight, I died several times. We rolled a total of seven times. The next time I got to see Barbara, she laying in her white coffin in her white dress. I've never, never been to a funeral before. The next time I got to see Barbara, she's dead. You can imagine how dark my life came. I turned to alcohol and drugs, and I did not know how to deal with this. And my life had completely, completely fallen apart. I attempted suicide 12, 14, 16 times, and my life had completely, completely fallen to hell. So this went until June of 1987. I went up to my parents' house, and during a long conversation, I came out to my parents. But in 1987, there's no letter. So I started through a few years of do I transition? Yes, no, yes, no. And I started making plans and I moved down to Southern California. I met a young lady and we started a friendship and we started hanging out and we started a relationship. I told her who I was, what I was doing. She was fully open and accepting with her. She ended up getting pregnant. We put my transition aside, even though she was very, very accepting to me. We had our first child, Jeffrey Allen Butterworth. We have, I was the perfect, perfect father. I wasn't the greatest husband, but I was the perfect, perfect father. We ended up having a second child, the most beautiful two little boys you can ever imagine. Well, the relationship started to fall apart. We ended up divorced. Long story short, we got back together and had a third child. 
and we had three little beautiful boys and everything was going well. Well, we ended up splitting up again and during a long three-year custody battle, $65,000, even though the judge knew that I was transgender, the judge gave me full legal physical custody of all three boys. Long story short, she was in another car accident. I let her come back and stay with us even though I was raising three boys. And she said, and I said, I need to transition. She said, I will help you. And she started working with me. So we moved all in together. We started planning my transition. She's, she has, as you have my full 100% support. All I ask is you tell the older two boys, all I ask is we wait till the youngest is a little bit older. We started making plans and we started making my, my moves to do my transition. She said, I will take the kids to Texas while you do your transition and everything will go. So we started making plans. And then in spring of 2000, and, well, this Christmas 2009, I flew to Texas. I came out to my eldest son. He's fully supportive of me. I came out to my middle son. He's fully supportive of me and everything was moving. Fantastic. Spring of 2010, I threw away all my boy clothes and I started living as Jessica full time. I went through my surgeries. I have me and my son, Jeffrey, are now living together. Um, these are just pictures of me during my transition as I've evolved. Transgender people change hairstyles, color, clothing, different things. We learn, we explore, we experiment. It's very, very common for the transgender community. So my eldest son, Jeffrey, and I are living together. My son, Bradley, comes to California numerous times. There's no problem. I'm on the phone with my youngest son three, four, five times a day, and everything is going absolutely fantastic. And my transition has gone beautiful. And there's what I look like now in 2021. But we're going to go back to 2012. My youngest son is now 12 years old. This is the arrangement me and their mother had made. When Curtis is 12 years old is when we start working with him. So I start calling their mother, start making arrangements. She cuts off all phone communication between Jeffrey and my boys. I'm emailing her, calling her. And I receive a letter from the state of Texas. Rachel has filed suit. My children's mother has filed suit to take away my parental rights to my youngest child. I hire an attorney. We go in front. I hire an attorney, John McCall. John, my attorney and I says, my attorney says, you're an open and shut case. You have full legal physical custody of all three boys and you have an agreement between you, you and their mother. We go in front of Judge Scott Becker. My attorney says, Jessica has full legal physical custody. He says, not any longer. She doesn't. And he ordered me or go to jail to have a psychiatrist psychiatric evaluation by this evaluator, a right-wing theology professor. Long story short, this right-wing evaluator came back and said, I am actually a better parent. I should start seeing my child through a psychologist immediately. The judge would not allow this in the courtroom, even though I, if I did not do it, I would go to jail. So during a long court battle, the judge terminated my parental rights. He said, I am never allowed to speak to my little boy. I'm never allowed to call him, even though I had full legal physical custody, even though their own right-wing evaluator would said that I am the better parent. This judge said, because I am transgender, I am never allowed to call my little boy. Curtis is never allowed to say, hey, dad, Merry Christmas. Happy birthday, dad. Hey, dad, I scored a goal in my football game today. I am never allowed to see my little boy because I am transgender. This isn't 1985. This isn't 1917. This is in 2013. A judge in Texas took away my parental rights because I happen to be transgender, even though I had full legal physical custody. My case went everywhere, all the way across the United States. Later that year on Christmas Eve, I come home from work and there in the mailbox, yellow envelope from her attorney to me on Christmas Eve, I open it up and what does it say? Dated December 20th, please find an enclosed copy of the order of this termination. They mailed this to me on Christmas Eve to say, F you, Jessica, you will never see your child again. Merry Christmas, Jessica. I sat there crying, going, and why would they do this? Why would they send this to me on Christmas Eve? Why? I start thumbing through the pages on page four of that same document. It is ordered that my name be removed from the birth certificate of my child. It was signed and dated September 20th, but they waited till Christmas Eve to say, according to the United States government, this judge went as far as removing my name off my little boy's birth certificate because I am who I am. My case went all the way to the Department of Justice. Later that year, I'm driving down the street. I receive a phone call from the Department of Justice. 
saying we've done a huge investigation into your case. This judge was way out of line. And they said, it's illegal. They cannot remove your name off your child's birth certificate. They cannot do it. It's illegal. I sent her the paperwork. And it turns out that this is the first and only time that a parent with a supportive, active role in their child's life has been erased of a child's birth certificate. Think about this. Because I am who I am, this judge went and erased my name of my child's birth certificate. As I said in the beginning of this presentation, the beauty of the world lies in the diversity of its people. I don't want to live in a world where everybody has the same God, everybody eats the same food, everybody listens to the same music, everybody has the same religion. To me, that is not beautiful. That is an absolute living hell. I don't want to look at a sea of students and everybody dresses and looks the same. I don't want my child to be forced to live into somebody that my child does not want to be. I want my child to be who my child wants to be. You see, I have lived an incredible and wonderful and beautiful life. Yes, I've had some hard things, but so have 7.8 billion people on planet Earth. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a journey. Mine just has to be a little bit, happens to be a little bit unique and a little bit different. How many people do you know have lived two complete genders? I am happy with me. I am comfortable with me. My problem isn't with me. My problem is society not accepting me because I don't fit in that acceptable amount of difference I have become just another secret as much as a stranger to my son as I am to the millions of other lighted houses I fly over in that night sky and all of this because that judge in Texas people like that judge in Texas people that believe that some differences are too much that some of those lights in the night sky deserve to be extinguished. So as I said, they said there's not much you can do with your case, but use your story to help change the world. I started speaking across California, and it started speaking across the United States, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, and I went to the big ones. I came here to England. I spoke at Oxford, Cambridge, and it started around the world. These are the leaders. You are the next generation. You're the teachers, the doctors, the surgeons. You are the next politician. And these are the parents. The students that I speak to are the parents of the next generation. Sooner or later, one, two, five, ten of you are going to know somebody, are going to find somebody, are going to meet somebody that happens to be transgender. I have spoken all over the planet, and South Africa happens to be one of my favorite places that I've done a lot, a lot of work in. And South Africa, I have had the honor of presenting where Nelson Mandela went to school. I spoke on the same stage that he used to lecture from. Nelson Mandela has the most powerful, powerful statement ever written. Education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. So as we leave this presentation today, I ask you to continue the conversation. Talk about it. Talk about what it means to be transgender. You don't have to talk about me. You can talk about Alan. You can talk about anybody. You can talk about somebody on TV. But together, let's change this world. Let's make it a better place that we can all be more accepting. And together, we can make this world a better and more beautiful place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, Jessica, um, I think I speak on behalf of a lot of the audience here, but thank you so much for sharing uh, your touching story with us all. Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, a lot of us are feeling a bit emotional right now. Um, and again, I want to speak on behalf of the audience saying that I think your way of storytelling is, is absolutely amazing. Um, and you're just a very inspiring individual. So once again, thank you so much for sharing that with us all. Um, I am really glad that you um, highlighted the discrimination that existed um, in the past and that unfortunately continues to exist today. Um, and it's this issue that really prevents us from you know, living in an equal and very understanding world. Um, but, you know, before I kind of ramble on any further, I do want to pass on over now to Alan, who's going to go into more depth um, on the kind of evolving terminology of gender and identity. So over to you now, Alan. Thanks, Zakia. Yeah, I'm going to try and do this quite rapid fire so we can get to uh, some questions from the audience. I see some come in already. Um, so part of mine is the aims of developing an understanding of the terminology, exploring the difference between gender, sex and sexuality and expression, uh, giving you the confidence to engage so you can learn and giving you practical tools to challenge non-inclusive behaviour. Uh, 
and attitudes. So I'd like you to think about what you would like to get out of today's session. So usually I would deliver this in a much longer uh, session. Uh, thanks, Pam. So content, I, I have covered names that this will be covered in this content, Terminology 101, uh, covering the uh, alphabet mafia, um, gender bred person, uh, why it's okay to be wrong and how to keep growing uh, and how to challenge yourself and others. So uh, everyone I hope knows the LGBTQIA plus acronym. Um, that's the most common ones, LGBTQ+, but uh, I'm just going to quickly go through them. So lesbian, same-sex attraction, specifically in reference to women. Gay, same-sex attraction, typically used for men attracted to men. Bisexual, attracting to more than one gender. Transgender, an umbrella term for any individual whose identity does not match their assigned sex at birth, so that includes trans and non-binary identities. Queer just signifies that the person does not identify as either cisgender and or heterosexual. Intersex, uh, born with both male and female sex characteristics, and these could be chromosomes, gametes, or morphology. Uh, asexual, a person with no or limited sexual attraction to others, and the plus just allows for the ever-increasing identities that fall under the LGBTQIA plus banner. Uh, so on to specifically gender, uh, cisgender, a person whose gender is the same as that assigned at birth. So you're born male, you identify as a man, you use he, him pronouns. You're born female, you identify as a woman, you use she, her pronouns. Um, transgender, an umbrella term for an individual whose identity does not match their assigned sex at birth, same as above. Uh, trans man, person who has transitioned from woman to man. Trans woman, person who has transitioned from man to woman. Uh, Non-binary is an umbrella term for those whose ident gender identity falls outside of the gender binary. Uh, and gender queer is quite similar to non-binary in the fact that it's also used as an umbrella term, uh, but it's often used to describe someone who feels that they have characteristics from both sides of the gender spectrum. Um, gender non-conforming, often a cisgender person who does not follow pre-described gender norms uh, and express themselves as they see fit. Agender, not having or identifying with a gender, they may describe themselves as being gender neutral or genderless. Uh, so onto the gender bread person, this is a free resource that all of you can find online. Uh, if you just type in gender bread person at Google, it'll bring up the website. Um, it's copyright free to use. Uh, it's a really useful way to break things down. Uh, I'll just go through it. So identity, how you and your head experience and define your gender, attraction, who you're romantically and or sexually attracted to, sex, the physical traits you were born with or develop, often in terms of sex characteristics or the sex you were assigned at birth, uh, and expression is how you present through actions, clothing uh, and demeanour, and then how this is perceived by others. So this is about uh, giving you that confidence. Um, it sounds weird, but you're going to get it wrong. This is not an easy thing to get your head around when we've grown up with particular ideals uh, within our society. So it's a complex issue that requires a lot of effort to start getting consistently right. Uh, we've got to unpick years of experience defined by patriarchal ideals. Um, Jessica mentioned it herself. She gets it wrong. Uh, misgenders are dead names. Uh, friends, uh, herself, uh, I do. I don't even pick up on it when people misgender me all the time. Um, it's just it takes a while to unpick years of experience. Uh, so with that, be prepared to be corrected. And when you are thanking the individual, thanking them about acknowledging that it was a mistake, uh, and that you want to learn and get better and be uh, like not get it wrong in the future. Um, there's a lot of chat going on at the moment, but I'd like people to think, what are you most concerned about getting wrong? Uh, and if you just want to pop in the chat, and we'll try and refer back to them uh, once I've finished. So these are uh, some discussion points that I, I like to bring up. Um, hopefully everyone knows that first one, is it okay to call someone a tranny? That's definitely a no. Uh, it wasn't okay 30 years ago, it's not okay today. Um, think about how you personally define gender. 
and what does cess mean? Uh, some more discussion points, differences between men and women, uh, how are transgender identities portrayed in uh, mainstream culture and media, what is the historical context and representation of trans identities, uh, what unconscious bias do you have for particular genders, um, particularly genders outside of that binary. Uh, think about identity and belonging, how can someone really feel that they belong if they can't be their true identity? and consider uh, what I've coined the European puritanical effect. Most of the anti-LGBTQ plus laws around the world stem from European colonialism, particularly British colonialism. So practical advice. Uh, I think Je Jessica still covers this in her presentation. It's quite, sh it's very short compared to what it usually is, but use gender neutral language where possible, it's best to practice. It is best practice to avoid the need for pronouns. However, where necessary, they, them, theirs are all grammatically correct alternatives for both he, him, his, and she, her, hers. I'd encourage you all to check your company's policies and see how gender inclusive they are. Um, so a few tips here for try and avoid. So try hello everyone or hi folks, welcome team instead of ladies and gentlemen, or even hi guys. Uh, try job responsibilities include or their job responsibilities include and avoid his or her job responsibilities include. Um, employees should contact human resources with any questions regarding their paycheck um, instead of employees should contact human resources with any questions regarding his slash her paycheck. Again, some more practical advice, share your pronouns. Uh, Put them in your work bio, your email signature, or your LinkedIn. Uh, when welcoming a new team member, tell them your pronouns. If you're not sure, ask for someone's pronouns, don't assume. Uh, this just helps normalize the use of pronouns and helps avoid misgendering. Uh, so if I was welcoming someone to the team, I would say, hi, I'm Alan or Al. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, welcome to the team. Uh, if I was talking to Jessica and I wasn't sure, I'd say, hi, Jessica, can I ask what your pronouns are? and how you prefer to be addressed. That's not asking Jessica what her preferred pronouns are, that's asking her what her pronouns are and asking whether she wants to be called Jessica or Jess or any variation of that. Um, then stick them in your bio and stuff. So you notice, if you can see me on the screen, it says Alan Reed brackets, they slash them. Uh, my email signature has, my pronouns are colon, they, them, theirs. So just some key thoughts, uh, keep learning and growing. Keep your terminology simple and be prepared to flex over the years. Language is an ever evolving tool. What's correct today may not be in 10 years. Ask questions. Um, if curiosity and questions come from the right place, there's little risk of causing offense. Be prepared to listen and accept the response. We are a curious species. We're inquisitive by nature. We should be asking questions and we should be trying to understand things. And remember, not all experiences are the same. Don't assume one trans experience is the same as all trans experiences. And don't assume one non-binary identity reflects all non-binary identities. So some questions, why make an inclusive workplace? These are some stats. Uh, so current UK estimates, according to the most reliable UK data uh, from Giles, an estimated 1% of the population is trans. This includes trans men, trans women and non-binary identities. That equates to what Jessica said, about 600,000 people in the UK. We have a population of roughly, roughly 60 million. Um, statistics from the EU actually put that at 4%. This means that 1% to 4% of your workforce uh, and or clients could be trans or non-binary right now. Um, this is expected to increase according to GLAD. We could see this uh, non-binary identities rise by 12 to 20% in the next 10 years. Uh, if you get it right now, you're less likely to face issues in the future and potential legal action later. Millennials and uh, Gen Z want LGBTQIA plus friendly workspaces. So millennials, my generation, uh, are expected to represent 75% uh, of the workforce by 2025. And studies suggest that 72% of millennials and Gen Z say they are more likely to choose a job with an LGBTQ plus inclusive culture 
that's definitely true for me. I won't be going back to anywhere that I think, think isn't LGBTQ plus uh, inclusive. And the last thing, it's, it's the right thing to do. Going back to the old adage, no one is equal until we're all equal. This includes LGBTQIA plus identities, as well as all other protected characteristics. And I believe I'm on my last slide, so we can get to questions soon. Um, think about some of these uh, options, uh, inclusive dress codes. Does your company have a different appropriate attire for men and women? Um, this can make it difficult for trans individuals to experiment with their expression before they come out. And it leaves no room for non-binary individuals. Uh, a lot of companies still actually do have dress codes built into their contracts, which are fairly exclusive. Um, inclusive gender records ensure non uh, uh, ensure non binary is available on gender records and ensure that the process is easy and inclusive for individuals to change at a later date. Uh, allow for gender neutral titles. So, does your company require Mister, Mrs, Miss, or Ms as part of your personal information? I would consider making that an optional, like people don't actually have to select one of them, but also adding in mix uh, as a gender neutral option. Uh, zero tolerance with, with anything uh, under the Equality Act, uh, any discrimination, harassment or victimization has to be met with zero tolerance. Um, all employees should feel safe and welcome at work, regardless of the identity or gender expression. The last one, gender neutral restrooms, is a bit contentious, but um, consider whether a collection of cubicles with their own private sink and locks will allow for more comfort than using, when using the facilities. This particularly allows for gender queer colleagues to use toilets without fear of awkward interaction and also saves them having to use the uh, toilet that best suits their gender expression that day. Uh, imagine a a gender fluid person who comes in with a suit and tie one day and a dress the next, which toilet are they supposed to use? Uh, I believe we're back, yes. Uh, so thanks for listening. Uh, I've seen a bunch of co um, comments come in, uh, but I'll let Zakia wrap up and then we'll come to the comments. Thank you for that great presentation, Alan. Um, I think it's great that uh, both yourself and Jeff Hatchess have really highlighted the importance of education and, you know, the powerful tool that it is. Um, and whilst you're both presenting, I was just taking a look at the chat and there are some great discussions going on. So now we do have time for a couple of questions. Um, we've had a few come in beforehand and some during the webinar. So we'll try or do our best to answer as many um, as we can. The first question um, that's coming is from Sam who asks, what do you wish teachers would teach or talk about when it comes to supporting young children in their developing gender identities? Um, I'm happy. I think that question came in uh, whilst Jess was doing um, her presentation. So if Jess, you want to take the lead first with that. Um, I believe in education as young as possible. Kids are the most open and accepting there are on planet Earth. So. Um, like I've done, I've done a lot of work with Stonewall over the last years pre-COVID, and I've probably done three dozen, four dozen um, talks to the young schools. So I believe that coming in to talk to the younger kids about gender identity, about these type of issues, is one of the greatest, greatest ways to introduce it. I mean, on Wednesday, I'll be in Birmingham at a, at a year nine school. That's I think that's 14 years old. But I believe it down to very, very young to teach them about this type of stuff. There are people that do specifically target young kids. There's a lot of literature. There's a lot of books introducing these young people to this type of stuff to understand that it's OK. It's nothing to be scared of. It's nothing to be discriminatory about. And just introduction. I don't know how many times I've walked into a school and they introduced me as a transgender speaker and kids will come up to me my sister's transgender my brother's cousin's trans you know what i'm saying people are especially youth are open and accepting so i am a firm believer in educating as young as possible about it extremely extremely about that i hope i answered i hope i read that question right <laughs> for that jess uh, alan do you have anything you want to add to that yes yeah, um i think Kids want to experiment. Like um, I know a lot of cis men who all remember trying on their mum's high heels. 
Um, they want to play dress up. They want to experiment with their expression. And I think certainly where I grew up in Scotland, uh, it was discouraged. Um, I think it needs to be encouraged that kids can express who they are whatever way they need to, uh, rather than trying to suppress what is essentially creativity um, and not allowing them to like work out who they are from an early age which resulted in me not realising who I was until I was at least 25. Can I add that to follow that? Are you done? Are you done? Yeah. Can I? What Ellen said is not discouraging a young child. Um, uh, uh, is Peter, Peter, I'm saying that right. Peter just said something. Um, I believe in educating as early as you can. Um, your educators in Australia contact me. I'm going to do an Australian trip next year. So we'll do come to your campus. Um, uh, but the thing is, is I would, I believe in non-discrimination towards a kid. If your child comes to you and says, mom, dad, I want to wear my sister, um, sister's clothes. I want to wear a dress. I want to look like a girl. Can you imagine the balls it takes for that child to come to say that they want to address an opposite gender or experiment or learn or play with it? And when mom or dad, usually dad says, no, my none of my boys are going to be wearing dresses. None of my children are going to do this or dress the opposite gender. It shoves that away, puts that divide and makes them scared. But would you, um, but when you let a child experiment, just like Alan is saying, let that child be open. It's one of the greatest ways you can do that with a child. Um, let them be free. Don't let them be scared to learn a little bit about who they are, how they want to dress, just exactly like Alan said. But anybody that's a parent has to have that openness. You know, does that make sense? Thank you for both those brilliant answers. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I know it's quite difficult to answer such uh, you know, heavy and important questions in such a short amount of time. Um, but I do have another great question here from Caroline. Um, he says, I understand that HMRC still need male, female information on their forms. Is this your understanding too? How can employers offer alternative pronoun identification in onboarding forms if they need to submit male, female information on these forms? So I'll take that since it's a UK specific question. Um, yeah, HMRC still need the, you, the employer to register whether the uh, employee is male or female, um, which I don't really see um, why HMRC needs that information, but it's a, it's a sign that our government still has a lot to catch up on and a sign that the reform to the Gender Recognition Act didn't go far enough. Um, but as an employer, you can still um, allow people the space to uh, self-identify with their pronouns and their gender expression uh, and everything. So whilst you have to, for legal purposes, ask them what their uh, sex is, you can also ask them what their gender identity is, what their pronouns are, and what uh, title they prefer to use. Um, those are the things that the, co the company can do individually and it isn't dictated by HMRC. Thank you for that answer, Alan. Um, and I'm quite conscious of the time, um, so I do apologise. I know that there are lots more questions that we do have, but right now that's all we've got. We've got time for in terms of questions and answers. But if you do have any more burning questions, we are happy to stay online for about 10 more minutes after the session. Um, but do remember that we will be responding to any questions that have been answered. Um, this will be done after the session via email. Also, do feel free to get in touch with any of the panellists or with the Equal Group. Um, I think my colleague has put the details in the chat for you all. So if you do want to get in touch, just reach out using those details. Um, and also, I can see a few people are logging off uh, because they have other meetings. So I do apologise for running over time. But it would be great if everyone um, could give us their thoughts and feedback on the session so far. So we're going to have a feedback poll that's going to be launched in the chat right now. It would be great if everyone could just spend a moment or two filling that out. Ben, um, I want to just kind of thank everyone um, who's filled in 
the feedback uh, poll so far. I really do appreciate it because it's nice to know what everyone's thoughts are. Um, so thank you again so much for that. But um, just before we do come to an end, I am going to spend about five minutes just going over how we can start embedding EDI strategy into the cultures of organisations. Um, so Pam, are you happy to put the presentation slides back on? Thank you for that. So um, as Jessica and Alan have already indicated, it, you know, it's all about educating yourself and working together to eradicate bias and make the workplace a much more inclusive place to be. And here at the Equal Group, we do that by basically working together with various organisations, generally across a period of a year, um, and just being very clear about what that organisation wants to achieve and the strategies that they need to kind of make sure that they are uh, making continuous progress. So our approach involves breaking down the process into four broad quarters. So the first quarter explores consultation and audit. Um, and the audit is basically all about collecting quantitative and qualitative data to make sure that organizations have very strong awareness of where they currently are at and where there is room for progress to be made. Um, following this, we then implement a strategic response. Um, and this basically looks at being very focused and very targeted and involves analyzing what your core concerns are and where there are areas where action needs to be taken as well. We then move on to the third quarter, which is about implementing those solutions by working with you to make sure that you have all the support um, and resources that uh, are needed to make this progress. And then finally, it's the last quarter, which is all about embedding and thinking about how you can measure and sustain this moving forward. Now, this stage includes measuring KPIs, ensuring that your goals are targeted to the outcome that you want to deliver, and also just looking at how you communicate um, progress as well. Now, by doing all of this, it really means that you're able to, um, when it comes to collecting data, you know, once again, that you are able to uh, constantly improve your access to data that is very relevant to you. Um, so that's just a very brief, brief overview of kind of what we do here at the Equal Group. Um, but of course, we'd love for you all to get in touch with us. Uh, one of the ways that you can do this is by booking a free consultation with us. The link will be posted in the chat, um, so you can all access the link there. And essentially, if you felt that we have kind of touched on the surface of an issue that um, you're struggling with, um, it would be then great to delve a little deeper and unpack that further. Or perhaps, you know, you want some practical tips um, specific to an issue that you are facing. So, yeah, we would love to hear from you. Uh, and also, if you've just enjoyed this webinar, please do engage with us on social media. It's at the Equal Group on Twitter, Instagram and LinkedIn. And you can also join our mailing list over at theequalgroup.com where you can subscribe there. And we do a fortnightly roundup of all the EDI news that's going on. So I think I've rambled on long enough, um, but that is it for today's webinar. So I just do wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. Alan and Jessica, thank you both so much for taking the time out to share your knowledge and experiences with us all. Um, are there any final words that either of you would like to share before we kind of wrap the session up. Thank you. Continue the conversation. Keep your minds open and please continue the conversations. When you leave here today, talk about this with your colleagues, your family, your wives, your mothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, because this is the way we all change the world. Yeah, I just echo that. Um, conversations, how we move the needle forward. Uh, the, this is such a polarised topic in a lot of such places. I don't think it has to be. I think people are talking past each other. Um, just try and approach it with empathy and understanding, regardless of which side of the conversation someone's on, because chances are they've misinterpreted something. They've been on a Facebook group that's uh, whipped up hysteria. Um, it's, it's just about making things fair, equal and safe for everyone. Thank you for those words. Um, and I'm just looking at the chat and, you know, uh, I'm loving all the feedback um, that everyone's giving us. I really do appreciate it. And I'm glad that you all found this a very informative and engaging webinar. So everyone, I do hope you have a great day. Um, and hopefully we will see you again soon for our upcoming webinar in November, which will be on equality, diversity and inclusion in the STEM sector. Um, you know, we will be sticking around just for a few more minutes if anyone does have any burning questions. 
But if not, I want to thank you all once again and hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.